So now we resume our afternoon uh, session and uh, we will have two talks uh, finishing the proof sketch of the MIT star equals RE result. And John will talk about the second part, uh, which includes uh, the PCPs and the introspection. All right, thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, so this is joint work with Zheng Feng Ji, Anna Natarajan, Toma Vidic, and Henry Yuan. And I'm just gonna start by um, kind of reminding everyone uh, the definition of MIP. Um, so MIP is a, the complexity class. So this is not MIP star, just MIP. It's a classical complexity class that you would uh, consider if you ask the question, what can two provers prove to a verifier with interaction? And the way this is typically modeled is you have a verifier that sits in the middle. It has some computational problem L that it would like to solve and an input an instance of that problem X, and it wants to know if X is in the language L or not. And maybe the language L is very complicated to solve and the verifier is simple in polynomial time. And so that might be a problem. And so in this model, we augment the, the verifier with the help of two provers who um, are all powerful so they can solve any problems that they want. And for this talk, we named the, the provers Alice and Bob, okay? And the, the constraint we put on the provers is that although they are all powerful, they can solve any computational problem, they cannot com communicate to each other. So the only means of communication um, between the parties here are between the provers and the verifier. And an instance of this MIP protocol will look something like this. The verifier will ask Alice a question and also Bob a question. And then we'll get back an answer from Alice and um, an answer from Bob. And based off of these answers, um, the verifier will either say, yes, I am convinced that X is in my language L, or no, I remain unconvinced that X is in the language L. So this is a complexity class, multi-prover interactive proofs, or MIP for short. And um, due to work by Babai, Fortnow, and Lund in the early 90s, we do know um, we have a precise characterization of the power of this class. They show that MIP is equal to NX. So what is NX? Well, NX is just non-deterministic exponential time. So it's the exponential time analog of NP, where um, rather than the verifier being get, uh, allowed to run in polynomial time, it's allowed to run in exponential time. And a kind of canonical problem um, that you might consider non-deterministic exponential time is the following. So um, given an exponential sized graph, is it three colorful or not? Okay, so this is like the, the exponentially large version of the three coloring problem, which is an NP complete problem. But in NX, you consider uh, the case where the graph is exponentially large. Okay, so it doesn't make sense, much sense to have inputs that are exponential. So um, what does it mean to have an exponential sized graph? Well, when we talk about um, this, this exponentially large graph, what we're actually talking about is the succinct three coloring problem. So in the succinct three coloring problem, your input is going to be a Boolean circuit C, which encodes a graph G sub C that has two to the N vertices. And how is this encoding done? Well, the circuit C, let's say it looks like this. Um, it's going to have two input registers, each of which consists of um, N input bit wires. Although the circuit um, encodes a graph with an exponential um, number of vertices, the circuit itself is small. So it's size polynomial in N. Um, and so it can be given as input um, to an algorithm. And um, the way it encodes this graph is as follows. So um, it does so using the adjacency representation of the graph. Um, since there are two to the N vertices, the, the vertices of G sub C are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the length N binary strings. And so for each vertex u in g sub c, we can associate with it um, a string in 0, 1 to the n. And so if we have two vertices in g sub c, u and v, and we want to know um, if they're connected in g, what we do is we write down their n bit representation. We feed the representation for u into the first register and the representation for v into the second register. And the circuit c will output 1 if um, u and v are an edge in g sub c, and it will output 0 otherwise. So this circuit encodes the graph G sub C. And now um, your goal is to output yes if G sub C is three colorable. And of course you wanna output no if this graph is not three colorable. 
So this problem is in NX, but not just that, it's one of the canonical NX complete problems. So it's as hard as any other problem in NX. And um, because as we saw in the last slide that MIP is equal to NX, then two all powerful provers can convince you that the graph G sub C is three colorable. And why this is kind of crazy is because um, this graph is exponentially large. So it's so big that you, you do not have time, a polynomial time verifier does not have time um, to actually read the entire graph. But in spite of this, if it's able to interact with two non-communicating provers, it can still become convinced that the graph is three colorable or not. So um, that's MIP. And this is the sort of problem you might solve with an MIP protocol. But of course, we're talking about MIP star in this workshop. And um, MIP star is just the quantum analog of MP, MIP. So it's a case of MIP where Alice and Bob are allowed to share an entangled state. And I'm gonna, so it's the exact same protocol. I'm gonna use these little yellow dots to represent um, Alice and Bob's uh, share of the entangled state. And so, yes, uh, these states are allowed to be entangled. They have some sort of weird quantum correlations that go between them. But as we've seen, this still does not allow them to communicate with each other. And, um, let me write down the standard completeness and soundness conditions that we have for this class. So if X is in the language L, then the provers should be able to convince um, the verifier to accept. And so this just means that there should be some Alice and Bob who share some entangled state that can convince the verifier with probability one. Um, in general, you can consider uh, convincing the verifier with probabilities less than one, but um, for this, this talk, it'll suffice just to look at the perfect completeness case. And then um, if your X is not in the language L, then it should be the case that no matter who Alice and Bob are, um, uh, they can only convince the verifier to accept with probability at most one half. Okay. So um, I'm gonna rewrite these conditions, um, introducing some notation that I'll revisit in like the last slide. So um, if X is in L, that just means that Q val of X is equal to one. So I'm going to write Q val of X just to mean on this input X, what is the maximum um, accepting probability that the verifier can have? So over all, all pairs of provers, what is the best that the provers can do? And if X is not in the language L, then it just means that the, the Q val of X should be at most one half. And as always this um, one half, you know, it's just an arbitrary constant so long as it's bounded away from one. Okay, so this talk, um, I'm just going to illustrate two tools of the MIP star equals RE result. We already saw one tool in, in the talk of Anand, which is this um, quantum low degree test, uh, which we use to self-test quantum states. And now I'm gonna show two more tools in this result. One of them is called introspection and the other one is called PCP composition. Uh, I'm gonna focus on the introspection tool because of the two tools, it's kind of the new one um, for this result. Um, on the other hand, PCP composition is standard. It's uh, been in theoretical computer science for about 30 years now, although there's still some bells and whistles that we need um, to implement it in our particular protocol. And um, I'm gonna illustrate these tools by studying a simple case of this MIP star equals RE result. So rather than looking at the full blown result, I'm gonna look at um, uh, kind of a stepping stone toward this result. Um, which was to show that MIP star contains NEEXP. Okay. So um, not as big as RE, but NEEXP is still bigger than NX. Um, and this is still like a non-trivial result about MIP star. And um, let me just say, what is NEEXP? So it's the complexity class non-deterministic doubly exponential time. Um, so this is the, uh, the version of NP where you're, Verifier is allowed to run in um, doubly exponential time. So in time two to the two to the poly n. So it's really big. Um, and what sort of problems do you like to consider in non-deterministic doubly exponential time? Well, here the canonical problem is a problem called succinct, succinct three coloring. And uh, it's stated as follows. So just as we saw before, how you can have a polynomial size circuit that um, succinctly represents an exponential size graph. You can also have a succinct circuit, which is polynomial size, and which represents an exponential size circuit. So your input in the succinct, succinct three coloring problem is just going to be a polynomial size circuit C, 
which succinctly represents an exponential size circuit C prime, which itself succinctly represents a doubly exponential size graph G. And the question that you want to answer um, when you, you solve this problem is just to figure out if G is three colorable or not. So um, what, uh, what seemed wild about this result at some point was that um, this graph is so big, it's doubly exponential, that um, to even write down the name of any vertex in this graph requires an exponential number of bits. And so um, this means that like uh, a polynomial time verifier can't write down the name of any vertex. It can't check a single edge in the graph. And in spite of that, um, two quantum provers um, that are all powerful and share entanglement can convince a verifier, a polynomial time verifier, that this graph is three colorable. Okay, so um, that's the result. That's what I'm going to tell you about in this talk. And without further ado, I'm just going to jump into it. So let me pause. Are there any questions before I, I begin? Yeah, okay. I just wanted to tell that uh, sure. for the people who are not panelists, uh, you can ask your question and answer in the Q&A. Uh, and then I will read it out to John. Okay, cool. So yeah, I'm now just going to introduce these two new tools, um, but in the context of these NEEXP contained in MIP star result. So yes, yeah, so I'm going to show you why is NEEXP contained in MIP star. But first, actually, um, it will be very helpful to kind of um, survey this result NEXP is equal to MIP. So this result from 30 years ago. Um, and this is a purely classical result. So in MIP, if you remember, the provers are classical. They don't share entanglement. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm going to do a super high level overview that will just give you like a couple of the ideas from that result that are going to be useful for our quantum protocol. So how do you show that NEXP is equal to MIP? Well, um, this entails just giving an MIP protocol for the succinct three coloring problem. And if you remember, we saw that succinct three coloring was kind of the NEXP complete problem, the canonical NEXP complete problem. Okay, so the MIP protocol for succinct three coloring. Your input is going to be this exponential size graph that's encoded with a succinct circuit. And your, the verifier just wants to know um, is the graph three colorable or not? So let me give like the, the most brain dead kind of trivial um, interactive protocol you can imagine to solve this problem. And I'm not even going to use the second prover Bob. I'm just going to have a single prover Alice. And what we'd like Alice to do is just send the three coloring of the graph G to the verifier. And this is great because the verifier, given this three coloring, can just sit down with the graph and check, hey, all the edges are properly three colored. But um, there's an obvious problem with this, which is that the graph is exponentially large. And so the three coloring of the graph requires an exponentially large number of bits to write down. And this is simply too, yeah. In the meantime, we had a question in the chat uh, regarding uh, whether uh, the fraction of graphs that are representable by uh, succinct three coloring is small. Uh, yeah, it should be very small. Should be probably an exponentially small fraction of all graphs. Is that good? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, it, it's still, yeah, it's like a, a vanishingly small fraction of graphs, but still um, a computationally difficult uh, fraction of the graphs. Um, okay, so, um, right. So uh, where was I? Um, okay, so one protocol you could imagine for solving the succinct three coloring problem is just to have Alice send over the, the entire three coloring of the graph G. But because G is exponentially large, the three coloring is exponentially large. And this is just um, too much information for our polynomial time verifier to read. Okay, but um, you know, that's uh, the most natural protocol that one could imagine. And really it, it seems difficult um, to even think of how the provers would convince the verifier that a graph is three colorable without just giving um, the three coloring to the verifier. So we have to figure out some way of still having this protocol work, but doing it in a clever way that doesn't require um, as much communication. So um, what we're going to do is rather than having the, the prover Alice um, send over the entire three coloring, we're going to have it encode her encoded in some clever way as a polynomial f, which maps fq to the m into fq. So um, here, fq to the m 
is just a finite field over Q elements. But you know, if you're uncomfortable with this, you can just pretend that it's the integers from zero to Q minus one. That will suffice for this talk. And this is gonna be a multivariate polynomial over, F, um, over FQ. So it has M different um, input variables. And we're gonna set M to be some number that's roughly a polynomial in N, okay? So at least to describe a single input to F still only requires um, a polynomial many uh, bits. Okay, and there's some clever way that they're going to encode um, this three coloring. And um, the idea with this encoding is that um, if your function f is actually, um, sorry, uh, right. Um, the, the idea of this three coloring is that when you do a properly a proper encoding of a three coloring of your graph, um, what you spit out is not just a polynomial f, but a low degree polynomial f, which properly um, encodes this three coloring. And it also turns out that for any low degree polynomial, um, it's easy to check whether it corresponds to a proper three coloring or an improper three coloring. So one that at least violates one edge in, in the graph. Okay, and let me explain for just um, one minute, why would you even think of encoding um, a three coloring with a polynomial? So the basic idea here is as follows. Um, if you're not able to read the entire three coloring, one idea that you might have is, well, maybe we can just pick an, uh, a vertex U and a vertex V in the graph and just look at the three coloring on these two vertices. What, what three coloring, what coloring does it assign these vertices? And just check that on this edge, um, you're, you're uh, properly colored. So what's an issue with that? Well, if the three coloring is improper, so it violates an edge, it might only violate a single edge in the entire graph. And because the graph is exponentially large, the odds of you correctly picking um, that one edge are very small, okay? Um, and so what we'd like to do is, yeah, is there a question? Um, okay. I, I wanted to ask, oh, I wanted to ask, uh, so like uh, a coloring, a three coloring is just a function from the vertices to, to the three colors. And right. there are many such functions and it seems that they are much less loading the polynomials. So, why is it even possible to represent them as low degree polynomials? Oh, so it's not going to be, um, it's not going to be like a bijective map mapping. Um, so for, for some of the low degree polynomials, um, some of the low degree polynomials will correspond to three colorings of the graph. Some of those polynomials will correspond to proper three colorings of the graph. Some will correspond to improper three colorings of the graph. And then there will be a whole nother set of three colorings, which don't correspond to um, any three coloring of the graph. But, but you are so, saying that the, the, set, the set of low degree polynomials is like, is as large at least as the set of three colorings? Yeah, yeah. If you set like the degree parameters right and the-, so the rather big, I guess. Yeah, you want Q to be big, you want M to be large enough. But I mean, notice, okay, I picked M to be like, um, oh yeah, yeah. So if you if you just set all the parameters correctly, there is a way to get many more low degree polynomials than you have three colorings. I see. Okay, yeah, so um, yeah, I was explaining why, why do these uh, low degree polynomials come up? Um, so again, you'd like to pick a random edge maybe and see if, if you have a violation on that edge, but um, a random edge will, you'll typically not see a violation. So you'd like some way of, of amplifying a single incorrect edge into many edges that are incorrect. So if you pick a random edge, you will actually see a violation. And a natural way of doing that is using an error correcting code. And an error correcting code is a way of taking a single error and blowing it up into errors in many different places. And so you can just kind of spot check um, randomly and find an error. And um, as it turns out, this low degree um, polynomial encoding of three colorings is um, an error correcting code. Okay, so that's why you might consider a low degree polynomial encoding. And so now um, the provers, what they'll have is they'll have this polynomial F. And again, if it's low degree, it's easy to check that it corresponds to a, a proper three coloring. But maybe the provers are lying to you. Maybe they have a polynomial F, which is not low degree. And so they're gonna try to trick you into thinking it's a three coloring um, by not actually having a low degree polynomial. So um, in this protocol, the MIP protocol, the main task is actually just testing that this 
polynomial f is actually low degree. And once you can do that, if you can verify that it's a low degree, then it's easy to check that it's a three color. And how do you verify that a polynomial is low degree? Well, it's done by something called the line versus point low degree test. Okay, so what is the line versus point low degree test? Um, so again, your goal in this test is to check whether this polynomial f, which maps fq to the m into fq, is a low degree polynomial. And so you're gonna do it in the following steps. In step one, you're going to pick a point u in fq to the m uniformly at random. You'll also pick another point v in fq to the m uniformly at random, and you're just gonna name that your direction. Okay, so it's a point in fq to the m, but we call it the direction. And in addition to having the point u, we're going to define the line L as follows. It's going to be the line um, L um, that passes through u in direction v. So it contains all the points u plus t times v, where um, t ranges over all elements of fq. So it's going to you know, contain u and u plus v, u plus 2v, and so on. And what is the verifier going to do with Alice and Bob? Well, the verifier is going to send the line L to Alice. And the verifier is going to send a point u to Bob. And Alice and Bob are going to reply with some answers that are formatted in a specific way. I'll talk about this a little bit in a second. And um, the way you cook up this protocol is that given these answers, the verifier can actually tell if your function f is low degree. OK, so um, as we're going to see throughout this protocol, um, or throughout this talk, the, the, what these answers are is not important at all, which is why I haven't specified um, them here. But just in case you're interested, what Bob is supposed to reply with is um, the function f evaluated at u. So Bob is supposed to say f of u. And Alice, who is given this line l, is supposed to reply with a low degree polynomial along the line l. And the check that the verifier is going to do is the verifier is going to check that the polynomial that Alice gives it evaluated at u is equal to Bob's um, value f of u. Okay, and if these two things um, agree with high probability, then it must be that um, f is actually a low degree polynomial. Okay, notice um, something um, interesting about this protocol, the way that it's set up. Um, Alice and Bob are, are non-communicating provers, okay? So they don't know the question that the other one is given. So if Alice is given L, she can't tell what um, or Bob what line she was given. And if Bob is, is given the point U, um, he can't tell Alice which point he's given. Um, but they're given partial information about each other's questions. So Alice knows that along her line somewhere is Bob's point. She just doesn't know which point it is. And Bob, he's given a point and he knows that Alice's line is just some line that passes through that point but he doesn't know which line it is. So they both are given incomplete and partial information about the other previous question. Okay, but for our purposes, it's not important what all these details are. So it doesn't matter what the answers are supposed to be. It doesn't matter what the verifiers accept condition. All that matters is that this is basically the main subroutine in this NX protocol, um, this MIP protocol for NX. So, you know, when I talk about this protocol in the future, just think the line versus point low degree test. And um, the other thing that matters is the formats of the questions, so that the questions are a line L and a point U located on the line. All right, so that was um, MIP equals NX. So now I'm going to move on to MIP star contains an um, NEEXP. And this is where we're going to see um, introspection and PCP composition. So before I move on, are there any questions? Okay. Um, all right. So uh, how do we show that NEXP is contained in MIP star? Well, this just entails giving an MIP star protocol for the succinct, succinct three coloring problem, which if you remember was the canonical NEXP complete problem. So now, rather than our input being an exponential size graph, our input is a doubly exponential size graph. Um, and I don't know, so now we have to devise uh, a protocol for this. And one idea is just, well, you know, we're not very creative. So let's just use the same protocol we saw on the last slide. So in other words, um, the provers have some sort of coloring for, for this graph. They should encode it using, um, a polynomial f, and then the verifier is suspicious of them, so the verifier runs a low degree test on that. 
And that protocol will look something like this. The verifier wants to know if G is in, is succinct, succinct, three colorful. So it's going to send the line L to Alice and the point U to Bob. And it's going to get back the answers ant A and ant B from Alice and Bob, respectively. But of course, we have the obvious problem, um, which is that uh, all this was fine and dandy when the graph was exponentially large. Um, the verifier you know, runs a polynomial time. And so it was asking questions that were size polynomial. It was receiving back answers that were size polynomial. And everything was peachy. But now the graph is doubly exponentially large. So it's exponentially bigger than it was before. And so this blows up all the parameters by a factor of exponential and n. So now the line and point, rather than being polynomial bits, they're exponential. And the answers that it receives, rather than being polynomial, are also exponentially large. And this is a problem because our, our small polynomial time verifier is simply not powerful enough to read, um, read these questions and answers. So we could think of this as one problem, which is that um, all the communication is just exponentially large. But actually, uh, in this talk, we're going to split it up into two separate problems. So one of the problems is that um, the questions are just too long. And the second problem is that the answers are too long. And um, this talk, what it's going to do is it's going to solve each of these problems one by one. OK, so the outline is going to be as follows. We have this protocol for succinct, succinct, three coloring where the question and answer sizes are both exponentially large. So first, we're going to do something called question reduction. We question reduce. And this will bring down the questions from exponentially large to just size poly polynomial and n. Um, it will do this while keeping the answers of size, polynomial, or of size exponential and n. So the answers will still be big, but the questions will be small. After doing question reduction, we'll do answer reduction. And this will also bring down the answers to size polynomial and n. Uh, so step one is, involves uh, the quantum. So this is why we have an MIP star protocol rather than MIP protocol. And it's also kind of the more interesting of the two steps. So this is, a, like I said, this is one that involves um, quantum. It's the one that involves a lot of new ideas, um, whereas the answer reduction is a bit more standard. And so I'm going to focus mostly on step one in this talk. All right, so question reduction. So um, the key idea of our question reduction um, protocol is the following. Uh, the questions that we have right now are exponentially long, which are too long for our verifier to sample. But we have two provers, Alice and Bob, who are omnipotent. And so sampling these exponentially long questions should be a piece of cake for them. So the idea that we, want, that we have is to just simply delegate the sampling of the questions to Alice and Bob, make them do all the work for us. And so if this is our protocol right now, the verifier, you know, it sends out L and U to Alice and Bob and it get, gets back the two answers. We'd prefer it if our protocol looked something like this. So what we would love is if, um, Rather than the verifier sampling the line and the point, we'd love it if Alice and Bob sampled the line and the point um, themselves and sent it to the verifier. So it would be great if um, Alice and Bob just told us the questions that we would have asked them. And then not only that, it would be great if Alice would say, um, uh, not only is here the line, um, here's the line that you would have told me, but had you given me this line, here is the answer I would have responded with. And it would be great if Bob would also, um, in addition to, to uh, him telling us to point you, it'd be great if he also told us the answer that he would have given us had we asked him the question you. So we call this idea introspection because um, the provers are introspecting. So rather than us asking them the questions, they're asking themselves the questions. And um, uh, this would be great. It has a lot of pretty obvious problems with it, um, which I'll address in the next slide. But kind of the most basic thing that you'd need um, to get this to work is a source of shared randomness, right? Because Alice and Bob need some sort of shared randomness to be able to sample their line and the, their point, which are, you remember, kind of uniformly distributed in FQ to the M. So how what might we do this with shared randomness? Well, um, let's imagine the most simple model of shared randomness that Alice and Bob could have. So suppose Alice and Bob had access to a shared tape. And what do I mean by a shared tape? Well, just imagine, you know, Alice and Bob are uh, sitting there in their rooms or um, somewhere in the galaxy, 
And just in the sky somewhere is just like a, a, a sequence of zeros and ones. So um, a, a, a sequence of zero ones that goes on forever, um, it just uniformly random and in independent bits that they can both look up into the sky and see. And it'd be great if Alice and Bob using their shared tape just um, uh, agreed ahead of time that the first chunk of it was going to correspond to the uh, random point u. And it'd be great if they also um, agree that the second chunk of it uh, would correspond to the random direction v and fq to the m. So supposing we gave them the shared tape, what would really be nice is if Alice just told us the line l that passes through u in direction v. Okay. And it would be great if Bob told us the point u. And if they were able to do that, if they did that, then they would be introspectively sampling uh, the questions that we were supposed to be giving them. Okay, but there are some obvious problems with this, which shows us that, that uh, shared randomness is simply not enough to carry out this idea. And the problem number one is just that um, Alice and Bob could lie, right? There's no reason why um, Alice is forced to tell you the line through you in direction V. She could just tell you a different line. And simple, similarly, Bob could look up on the shared tape. He could see the point U. And instead of telling you U, he could tell you a different point U prime. Um, in other words, you know, um, Alice and Bob could always uh, tell you lines and points that are easy for them to answer. Maybe they, can, maybe they would just avoid asking like the hard questions and only ever ask themselves the easy questions. And there's no way for you to check that. Okay, um, another problem, which is, seems even more fundamental is even if they were being honest, um, they can still see each other's questions. So Alice can see Bob's point and Bob can see both U and V. And so he knows Alice's line L. Um, and so if the two provers know each other's questions, then we've defeated the entire purpose of having um, multiple provers to begin with. They can now act as a single prover. So what we really need is a source of shared randomness that the verifier can control um, and a source of shared randomness where the verifier can prevent these two cheating strategies um, from happening. And um, the source of shared randomness that we're going to use is um, entangled quantum states. So um, yeah, we've seen a lot of entangled quantum states. So as we all know, um, entangled quantum states are a form of shared randomness between uh, two parties. And um, the way that we're going to use these entangled states is using these protocols that we've seen in previous talks, these self-testing protocols. So we saw in Andrea's talk and Anand's talk. Um, and these are protocols which give the verifier um, control over the prover state and the way they interact with it. Um, in particular, if you run one of these protocols, you can force the provers to share a specific quantum state. And not only that, you can force them to perform specific quantum measurements on the state. And of course, when I say a quantum protocol here, I specifically mean an MIP star protocol. So it fits exactly within the model that we're looking at. Um, so it's one of these protocols where the verifier will ask questions to the provers, get back answers, and um, if the provers pass the test with high enough probability, then they must be satisfying um, items one and two. So this seems promising. Um, and really our goal now is to find one of these self-tests where the state and measurements that you get out of it correspond in some manner to the line versus point distribution, which is the, 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 the distribution that we want them to introspectively sample. So the protocol we're going to use is this quantum low degree test, which um, Anand described in his talk. Uh, this is from joint work with uh, Anand Natarajan and Toma Vidic. And what their result says at a high level is the following. Um, using this quantum low degree test, you can command uh, your provers to do two things. Number one, you can force them to share an exponentially large number of entangled qubits. And number two, you can force them to perform um, specific types of measurements that I'm going to call total X and total Z measurements. And I'll explain a little bit more about those later. And not only that, even though you're forcing the provers to share an exponentially large number of entangled qubits, 
Um, the question size that the verifier has is only polynomial in n. Okay, so this seems great for us because um, if you remember, we want the verifiers, or we, sorry, we want the provers to have, to be able to sample these lines of points that are exponentially long. And so they need some sorts of shared randomness that has um, an exponential number of bits. And that seems to be what number one is giving us. But at the same time, we're, we're in question reduction. And so we want the verifier to have uh, questions that are sized not exponential, but polynomial. And again, that seems like something that this, uh, this test gives us. All right, so what does this mean? Um, what are these total X and total Z measurements? Um, well, we have to understand what these things mean. And rather than really going into what these are, I mean, if you, if you know what these are, um, this is just uh, um, the measurements that the, the provers perform by either measuring all of their qubits in the X or the Z basis. Um, and so hopefully some of you know exactly what that is, but if not, I'm just going to give you a toy model um, that suffices to kind of capture all the interesting properties about this. Um, uh, and yeah, yeah, we'll show you exactly how this introspection works. So this toy model, I'm going to call it the EPR toy model. And you know, Alice and Bob are sharing an entangled quantum state, but for now I'm gonna forget about Bob. I'm just going to look at Alice. And her entangled quantum state, you know, on her side it corresponds to some number of qubits, but I'm gonna ignore qubits. And all Alice has access to is something I'm going to call an EPR box. So this EPR box is literally just like a box. And there's two registers, one labeled Z, one labeled X. And the Z register is going to be a string A and FQ to the M, which is sampled uniformly at random. And in the X register is another string B and FQ to the M sampled uniformly at random and independently of A. Now, Alice is not um, going to be able to interact with the EPR box by just looking at it. So she's not, we're not allowing her to just look at A or look at B. Instead, um, her, her interactions are via something that we call the Z dot product table. So she, she's going to have sitting next to her EPR box, another table consisting of all the Z dot products. Um, what does that mean? Well, it's going to con contain all of the dot products of strings and FQ to the M with her string A. So it's gonna have a dot all zeros, which is just zero, um, a dot all zeros one, dot, 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 um, all the way down to a dot all ones. Actually, you know, um, this is over FQ. So that should be a dot, you know, Q minus one, Q minus one, dot, dot, dot. So um, in particular, for any string Z in FQ to the M, there's going to be some entry on this table that will tell you the dot product of A and Z. All right, and similarly for the X register, um, rather than being able to read the entire string B, Alice is allowed to just look at the X dot products. So um, she's gonna have this other table and for every X in FQ to the M, there's going to be an entry in this table that tells her B dot X. All right, so she has these two tables of dot products sitting there in space. There's gonna be one more rule that specifies how Alice is able to interact um, with these tables, which says that when she reads some of the entries of these um, tables, it will erase some other entries of these tables. So in particular, whenever Alice reads the cell A dot Z, she erases each cell B dot X, such that Z dot X is not equal to zero and vice versa. So she reads a cell B dot X, then she has to erase each cell A dot Z, such that Z dot X is not equal to zero. So pictorially, what might happen um, on Alice's side is the following. Maybe she's going to read um, a certain string Z in the Z dot product table. And the effect that we'll have is to erase some of the entries in the X dot product table. So she can no longer access those. And now maybe she wants to read some entry X in the X dot product table. And that will entail erasing some of the entries in the Z dot product tables. And maybe she wants to read another string X prime in the X dot product table. And that will entail erasing more entries in the Z dot product table. All right, so, um, all right, so that's uh, a lot of information to throw at you. So let me go through a couple of examples that will hopefully um, give you intuition for how this works. So example number one, suppose um, Alice goes to the X dot product table and just reads the entries B dot EI for each I. 
So here EI is the ith standard basis vector. It has a one in entry i and zeros in all the other en entries. Well, what's that going to tell her? She's going to learn um, the value of bi, the ith coordinate of b for each i. And therefore, she's going to know the entire string b. So she's read basically the entire um, x register. But now, suppose she wants to go to the z register and learn something about a. What can, what, what can she learn about it? Well, that's dictated by that rule that we just saw. And um, suppose she wants to read maybe an entry z in, in the table. Well, um, every non-zero z has a non-zero coordinate i. And therefore, that coordinate um, i has a property that z.ei is not equal to 0 for that i. And because we already read ei in the x dot product table, this will tell us that um, the entry a.z is erased in the z dot product table. And because this happens for every non-zero z, the entire z dot product table is going to be erased. And as a result, we will have no information about a. So in other words, if we read all of the x dot product table, we erase everything in the z dot product table. This is what I'm going to call a total x measurement because she she's learning all of the x information, but none of the z information. And you can define total z measurements similarly. Okay, the second example is as follows. Suppose Alice goes to the x dot product table and reads b dot e1. Then our rule tells us that she can't learn any a dot z if z1 is not equal to zero. So she can only read a dot z where z has a, not, a, a, a zero first coordinate. So she wants she could read the entries a dot ei for each um, i not equal to one. So she could read a dot e2, a dot e3, and so on. And what this would tell her are the values a2 through am, but not a1. So um, if she reads b dot e1, she's prohibited from learning the first bit of a, but she can learn all the other bits. OK, so that's Alice's side of the equation. What, what does Bob see? Well, he gets his own EPR box, and his box is filled with the exact same a and the same b. So you know, um, for example, if both of them do total z measurements. Both of them will get the strings a. If both of them do total x measurements, both of them will get the strings b. And if one does a total x measurement and the other one does a total z measurement, then one will get the string a and the other one will get the string b. And so we see how different ways of accessing these boxes will give them different levels of correlations between the information that they get. All right, so um, I promised you that this was somehow uh, a good model for entangled uh, quantum state. So why should this look uh, like it's a good model for this? Why should it look physics -y to you? Well, number one, it looks like there's some sort of entanglement here um, because Alice and Bob have this sort of shared information um, in their boxes. Uh, it's also physics -y because it has this like Heisenberg uncertainty principle aspect to it. Um, you know, that says that like a particle, if you learn its, its position, then you have to erase its momentum. Uh, but similarly here, if you learn like Z information, you have to erase X information. Okay, so we have some sort of uncertainty principle stuff going on here. And finally, this is like non-signaling as well, which is a property that quantum mechanics has. Um, they can use these boxes to correlate, but they can't use them to communicate. All right, so the summary thus far, um, as we saw before, um, using the quantum low degree test, you can force the provers to share these EPR MQ boxes. And you can also force them to do total X or total Z measurements on these boxes. And not only that, um, uh, when you use this test and force them to have uh, boxes of size M, the question size that you have is only logarithmic in M. So again, you remember, we want them to have an exponential number of um, of uh, bits that they're sampling. So here M will be exponential. And so this will give us boxes that contain exponentially long strings, but our question size will be only polynomial. And our goal is for Bob to sample a point U and FQ to the M uniformly at random. And for Alice to sample um, a, a direction V and FQ to the M uniformly at random, and then to sample the line L, which goes through U in direction V. Okay, well, I'm going to ignore um, the fact that V is uniformly at random. Let's just fix V for now. Let's ignore the issue of sampling V and just fix a V. 
And in fact, let's just do this for V being um, like the most trivial vector I can imagine, which is a one in the first coordinate and zero elsewhere. Okay, so how can we get them to sample a point and then align through this point in that direction? Okay, so um, the way we're gonna do it, uh, using the low degree test, we can now force them to share the EPR boxes. And I'm gonna begin by suggestively renaming the entry in the first cell from A to U, okay? So the verifier is going to tell Bob to do a Z total measurement. And because we've done the quantum low degree test, Bob has to do the Z total measurement. And so what he's going to do, he's going to look in the Z register, read off the, uh, the U and report that back. And so now we've, we've sampled this random point. And um, so now we just want Alice to learn the line L that goes through U in direction one, zero, 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 zero. One thing we could tell Alice to do is just also do a Z total measurement. And what she would do if that happened um, was she would just learn all of U and that'd be enough to, um, to learn this line L as well. But of course we wanted to learn the line L without learning U. So um, as it turns out, uh, it, to learn the line L, but not U, is equivalent to learning the uh, values U2 through UM, but not U1. Well, why is that? Um, it's because every point in L agrees with U on coordinates two through M, but the other points will disagree with U on the first coordinate. So every possible value for the first coordinate will occur somewhere along this line, but um, all the other coordinates will agree with you. And so once you learn U2 through UM, you learn all of the points in the line L and therefore you learn the line L. So we just need her to learn these, these values U2 through UM and we wanna have some sort of certificate that she also does not learn U1. But this is exactly our second example that we saw earlier. If we can get her to measure B1, um, then this will prohibit her from learning U1, but then she was also able to learn the values U2 through UM. Okay, so we want her to tell us B1 and U2 through UM. And now we just have to check that she acts honestly. And why don't we get this necessarily for free? Well, um, neither of these things that she's reporting back to us are total X or total Z measurements. It's some sort of intermediate between a total X and total Z measurement. Okay, so um, what we're going to do to check she acts honestly is just half the time we're going to tell Bob to do a Z total measurement. He'll measure the entire string honestly and we just check her UIs against his. And because he's acting honestly, she will be acting on honestly. And the other half of the time, we'll tell Bob to do an X total measurement and he'll read the entire string B um, and we can just check her B1 against his. And again, because he's acting honestly, she has to be acting honestly. Okay, so that's it. I mean, that's lines with uh, this particular direction. And now let's imagine how would we do um, the case when um, the direction isn't fixed to one zero zero zero, but it's just some other general direction. And we're going to start similarly as before. Just a reminder that uh, we are uh, approaching the end of the end of the talk. Like we have like five more minutes to wrap up. Would it uh, be sufficient? Uh, I might have to go over by five. If that's, if that's okay. I mean, we yeah. I mean, we have like three more minutes scheduled. So maybe, do you think that in like, I don't know, eight minutes you can wrap up the thing? Uh, yeah, hopefully, let's see. Okay. Okay, so this is a general direction D. Um, uh, yeah, how do we do this case? Well, the verifier will tell Bob um, again to just to do a Z total measurement. And um, again, we want Alice to learn the line through U in direction B, but not the point U. And so it's just an exercise that um, just as before, where um, all we had to do was get Alice to read one entry in the X dot product table. For here, um, it suffices to have Alice measure the entry B dot B. And it turns out if she measures this, it will, um, she still has enough um, information in the Z dot product table to learn the line L, but um, she will not be able to learn anything more about the point U. All right, so that was question reduction. Um, in summary, how did it work? Well, we used introspection to have the prover sample the questions um, for us. And we used entanglement to, uh, between them to have them jointly sample from the line versus point distribution. But we used the uncertainty principle to hide the information about the other players' questions. Uh, 
Similar ideas work for the other questions in the 16th, 16th three coloring protocol. So, you know, I told you that this protocol was mostly the line versus point low degree test. That was kind of a lie. I mean, there's some other interesting things that go on there, but we can use similar ideas to, to handle the other questions that arise there. And this establishes the result NEEXP is contained in MIP star with polynomial size questions and exponential size answers. Okay, but now we also wanna do answer reduction. And let me just very briefly describe how this works. Um, in answer reduction, uh, we have our protocol that looks like this. The verifier, it has Alice and Bob, they have their quantum states. The verifier asks questions and gets back answers. And um, the questions are size polynomial, but now the answers are size exponential. And we'd like to reduce the, uh, yeah. John, we have a question about uh, whether it is because of entanglement that it doesn't matter if Alice or Bob lies. I guess, or like how, how to catch whether they try to lie. Right, um, it's exactly this property of the self-test. Um, so the self-test, if, if they pass the self-test with high probability, this is a, the quantum low degree test. If they pass with a sufficiently high probability, then um, they can't be lying. They have to be honest that they're performing these total X and total Z measurements. And then we can bootstrap the honesty that they have for total X and total Z measurements to force them to um, also, you know, correctly sample the lines and the points. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, all right, so the, the answers are too long to read and that's a problem for our, our polynomial um, uh, time verifier to check. And so what we'd like to, uh, the verifier to be able to do is check if it should accept the answers AA and AB, but it'd be nice if it could do it without reading all of AA and AB. So can, it, can they check that they should accept the answers without actually reading all the answers? And let me just say the solution here is yes, you can do it using this, these ideas of probabilistically checkable proofs from the computer science literatures. And since I'm short on time, I'm kind of going to skip over um, exactly how these things work, but in general, probabilistically checkable proofs, they allow you to um, verify maybe a very large statement by only checking a small number of bits from the statement that you're trying to check. And so the verifier, rather than um, receiving the entire answers from Alice and Bob, um, will instead only ask for Alice and Bob to send back you know, a small subset of the bits of the answers. The verifier only reading those bits will still be able to check um, that it should accept the, the answers A, A and AB. And well, I have some more details on this if you want. Um, I have two slides, so if people are interested, I can talk about that later. There's some annoying details they have to get through, but um, let me talk about compression because I have to state the compression uh, theorem. Uh, our result here is basically a compression theorem. So what do we do? We took this protocol, which we got from the MIP equals NX protocol. It was a big protocol. I mean, it, it dealt with exponentially large answers and questions. And we applied some sort of compression ideas. We somehow managed to shrink this protocol um, to one where all the exponentials were compressed down to polynomials. Um, and this allowed us to show that NEXP is contained in MIP star. But you might ask, I mean, why only do one round of compression? Instead of taking a big protocol and compressing it down to a small protocol, why not start from a very big protocol, compressing it down to a big protocol, and then compressing it down to a smaller protocol? Or, I mean, why not um, do this three times or four times or whatever? So this was um, inspired by prior work of Zheng Feng Ji and a paper of Fitzsimmons et al, who kind of, Zheng Feng introduced this idea of compression and then Fitzsimmons et al um, uh, study what happens when you repeatedly apply a compression procedure. So in our case, what would this look like? Well, um, our first compression is what I did in this talk. We started with this a protocol that had the low degree test. And using introspection, we were able to compress it um, with the quantum low degree test. So now we have a new protocol. Maybe the main aspect of it is this quantum low degree test. And it allows us to um, compress the low degree test in some sense. So if we wanted to compress this again, well, we now have a protocol where the main subroutine in it is a quantum low degree test. And you might ask, can we introspect the questions from that? That, that test? Well, it's not clear. I mean, it's not the low degree test. I showed you how to introspect the low degree test. What about the quantum low degree test? I don't know, but 
it turns out the main subroutine in the quantum low degree test is the low degree test. So, I mean, that gives you some hope. Maybe we can use similar ideas to introspect that. And that would give us some um, result of compressing again. Um, and then maybe we want to compress again a third time. So now we start with whatever protocol we get at the output of the second compression. And you might ask, can we compress that? And so on. And so this, this will continue on for a while. I mean, every time you compress, you're going to get some new tests that you need to introspect the questions from the previous protocol. And things might get very complicated. But um, one of our main results in this paper was that we can actually um, compress any protocol which looks like the low degree test. And at least for this talk, you can just think of these protocols as maybe generalized low, low degree test. Though, um, as you'll see Jeng Feng talk about in the next talk, um, there's a technical definition of what these things are, which are conditional linear functions. So let me just state the compression theorem, and then I'll end here. Um, the compression theorem, rather than being applied to non-local games, or MIP star protocols, it's actually just applied to non-local games. We've seen these um, a bit already, um, and it's actually applied to uniform families of non-local games. So what is a uniform family of a non-local game? Well, just one that is um, specified that you can compute with a Turing machine, G. So in other words, you know, I have a Turing machine, I have a program, I feed in the number N, and it will output the description of a non-local game, G sub N. And um, if you do this for all different inputs you, you can have, then this Turing machine naturally encodes a family of non-local games, G1 through dot, dot, dot. And the compression theorem is as follows. We give the, the, we show the existence of a Turing machine that we call compress. And it takes as input um, a Turing machine that um, encodes one of these uniform families of non-local games. And it outputs another Turing machine, which um, encodes a different uniform family of non-local games, H. And, um, you know, the first Turing machine encodes the family G1 through G2 dot dot dot, a sequence of them. The second one encodes this family H1, H2 dot dot dot. And the idea um, is that you want the non-local game H sub n to simulate the non-local game G sub n plus one. So um, you want to compress uh, your family down a level. You want to shift everything over uh, one level. So, you know, um, H sub one should simulate G sub two, H sub two should simulate G sub three and so on. And what do we mean by simulate? Well, we have the following three conditions. First off, if the value, the quantum value of the game G sub n plus one is equal to one, then the quantum value of the game H sub n should also be equal to one. So it should preserve the value of the game. It's not too bad. Um, the second condition deals with this, this um, quantity E H N one half. And this is just the number of entangled bits Alice and Bob need if they want to succeed with value at least one half. Okay. So in general, you know, in our games, we want our provers to be sharing a lot of entangled bits. So in a lot of these games, um, you expect that this value is going to be large. And what our theorem says is that um, the number of entangled bits that the, 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 the provers will need to share to achieve value one half in game H of N will be at least the number of bits that they need to achieve value one half in game G of N plus one. Okay, so that's again, that you're kind of simulating that game. It's also going to um, be lower bounded. They will also need to share some entangled bits corresponding to the length of the questions in bits of game G sub N plus one. And this is might seem weird, but if you remember, um, what were we using some of our entanglement before? It was to, um, as shared randomness, to introspectively sample uh, the questions from our games. And so similarly here, when we compress, we're going to force the provers to share some number of entangled bits um, so that they can sample the questions from GM plus one. All right, so because it's, uh, lower bounded by both of these is definitely lower bounded by the max of these. And then the final thing is that the complexity of H of n should be polylogarithmic in the complexity of G sub n plus one. And so what does that mean? Well, um, let's say G sub n plus one has a verifier and maybe it runs in exponential time. Then we'd like to, the verifier in, the, in H of n to only run in polynomial time. So, okay, we, we preserve two properties, the quantum value and the amount of entanglement that you need to do well while shrinking the complexity an exponential amount. And that's our compression theorem. 
Um, a technical point, again, this only works if the game G is one of these generalized low degree tests that I mentioned earlier. But this compression theorem also outputs an H, which is also a generalized low degree test. And as a result, you can repeatedly apply this compression over and over again to your heart's desire. All right, and um, once you've established this, as Zheng Peng will talk about in his talk, this is sufficient to um, imply a result MIP star equals RD. And uh, that's all I have, so thanks for listening. Okay, so let's thank John. Uh, yeah, uh, I guess uh, we, if, if there are some more questions, then people can ask that while uh, we will resume with the next talk uh, in a quarter an hour, like a half past three. <laughs>